Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm Catherine O'Shea. I am a graduate of UC, um, their literature program in 2012. And hello, I'm Katie Trout taylor and I am a graduate of UC's MA program in 2010. So we just missed each other. Yes. Yeah, so today Catherine and I want to talk about our experiences as English majors going into the business and nonprofit world and also the public sector. I think actually together yeah. and yeah. with our team at Untold Content, we've worked in all sectors, public, private, and nonprofit and the university. Yeah. So we can talk about our transitions and and then also share with you what skills as an English major we found to be incredibly important in the world outside of academia mm -hmm. and also what you can be doing as a young English major or a graduate student um, who is seeking to consider non-academic opportunities. Let's start with this question of what skills from our degrees do you mm -hmm. find yourself employing in the corporate and nonprofit world. What I realized when I decided to shift outside of academia and get a job in the nonprofit realm um, was that I needed to um, be proactive in making sure that I was highlighting the skills that I had learned through teaching, through the graduate work, mm -hmm. and communicate those to the people that I was in interviews with, that I was trying to network with, um, when I was looking for different jobs to understand how that kind of language um, transferred across industries. And so one of the big skills that I realized that I was able to bring was understanding um, through written communication or other forms of communication, what other people wanted, what their needs were, what their goals were, um, and um, working to bring those together. So a lot of my work has been about building partnerships. And that to me, um, I feel like is one of the most important things that I've brought from my graduate work is really being able to read others and what they're trying to get at and um, bring those all to the table so that even though they all might think they have different goals, that we can find the pieces that really bring that um, help them collaborate in more effective ways. So that's one of the biggest skills that I brought. I love that because that's sort of the, the space where communication and English overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think English majors, we should pride ourselves a little bit more on how advanced our communication yeah. skills tend to be yeah. and how we've really honed the art, whether it's right. through analyzing literary characters or... Right. Um, Engaging or, students in a classroom yeah. and making them feel like they're really understanding the uh, intense material more directly. Yeah. Yeah. Training people on how to collaborate. I mean, all of the mm -hmm. things that we're engaging in on a human level speak to that ability to understand needs and then try to come up with solutions that address some of those, you know, different right. stakeholder needs. Yeah. I think another skill is you know, on a literal level, your ability to write well mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we, as English majors, I think we tend to be fairly humble about that, but the ability to see how language could be communicated more clearly or more concisely mm -hmm. or more in, in a more engaging way, mm -hmm. that is a talent and a craft that people across all sectors outside the university are interested in. Mm -hmm. Just a couple weeks ago, the CEO of Goldman Sachs was interviewed and he just happened to mention in the interview that the one skill that he sees um, lacking the most in the workforce is the ability to write well. Mm -hmm. It's considered a top three skill by most employers. Mm -hmm. A top three skill that they're looking for when they're deciding whether to hire you or someone else. So just the ability to write well. Right. I think is incredibly important. Right. And when I started my company, when I started consulting, that was all I was doing was just editing, was trying to provide a kind of right. sharp editorial eye to whatever came across my desk. Right. And the motto of my like company when it first started was we do writing and you don't worry. And it was kind of along that line. It's not our right. motto anymore because now we're working at a more strategic level with our clients. But at that time when it was all about just providing that muscle behind right. making sure things come across as clearly as they can, right. um, that's really important. I think too, at the graduate level in particular, but even at a bachelor's level, being able to do database research and understand evidence, being able to look from multiple points of view, pull in and creatively think about how to support your arguments, that is all insanely yeah. important. And yeah. in organizations where that's not important, that should be concerning. And you might not want to work in organizations right. that 
aren't you know that aren't listening to evidence or aren't listening to research that are ignoring certain perspectives right i think the nonprofit sector nonprofit and public sector in particular are really powerful examples yeah. of making sure intentions are right yeah. and always keeping in mind public good as right. the outcome. Right. Um, I think that the private sector, uh, depending on the organization, can be doing that kind of work as well, but there's an opportunity, I think, for more people who can read and analyze evidence to continue to support an organization in seeking tr what is true right. and propagating and communicating what is true. Right. Cool. Okay. What skills did we not have <laughs> <laughs> after grad school that we had to later build in our careers? Yeah. Not to stress anyone out because yeah. you build these skills over time, but what do we kind of looking right. back, what did we have to work hard right. at? And maybe what of? you could pay attention to so you can learn from what we had struggled with. Yes. How do we <laughs> spend a lot of time learning? <laughs> yeah. We have all these amazing skills. I made the mistake of assuming that everyone can make that jump with me. That even though my practical experience had been as a graduate student and as a teacher in academia, that it made sense that I was now applying to program management jobs. Um, and so it was helping. I realized I had to be the person building that bridge for them. I had to explain um, why those skills that I was learning there are so relevant to what they were looking for. Um, so making sure that when you're doing that networking that you um, aren't looking for exact line by line, this is what I did, this is what the job is looking for, but making sure that you understand that jump and then explaining that to other people. I think that skill I've really had to build. Um, and being bold in that networking so that you feel, if you are interested in corporate work or nonprofit work, um, that you are willing to take that step out and ask for coffee with people and kind of help build those bridges and, and figure out how you're gonna communicate. Practice communicating um, what those skills are that you're bringing to the table and how that connects in all the different industries that you might be interested in going to. One thing you can do in grad school, it, to speak to what mm -hmm. Catherine's saying, is at conferences, share your elevator pitch and don't share the same elevator pitch with every person. Start right. by asking, what that person's interested in, what their research focuses on, what kind of classroom environment they try to create. Mm -hmm. Start by learning about the person and then tailor your experiences to match and meet theirs where it's right. at. And that doesn't mean right. you have to be inauthentic. You have to be authentic. But I have one elevator pitch or like description of my background that has a lot to do with like Appalachian and rural studies mm -hmm. that I would only share in pr with particular audiences. Right. I have a whole different part of my background that would be like medical writing and right. I'd speak to that or classroom and right. professional training, you know, I right. could draw on history in the classroom for that. So I think getting used to kind of switching your pitch and switching how you frame your experiences, that's a right. really good exercise. Keep right. practicing that. Yeah. What about you? What skills do you feel like you've been building? Yeah, that I didn't have then. I think I, I think we all start this in, in college and grad school, mm -hmm. but the most Im immense, uh, imagine like the most challenging project management tasks and like that's where, that's what I'm doing now. It's trying to run a company is mm -hmm. one of the biggest operational challenges. And I'm looking at budgets and looking at systems and thinking about how do we predict the amount of time that it takes to do creative work I mean, that is a question. Like yeah. some people could say yeah. that I'm crazy for asking it, but I promise you whether you become a professor or whether you work in the business world like mm -hmm. I mostly do, you're going to be answering that question. If you can show your manager or whoever you're reporting to that you can think about what your time is worth, what you're spending your time on, making sure you're being most effective but also not underselling yourself. Yeah. Um, that's extremely valuable because that's every single business, um, for profit and nonprofit is constantly thinking about that. Is that resource management? Um, so if you can speak to that yourself and help them think through that, um, they will really, really appreciate you. <laughs> I love that point. Yeah. Okay. What practical tips and takeaways would you give mm. to people who are wanting to at least understand what options exist outside of academia? Yeah, so uh, one of the ones, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier, was um, thinking about the work that you've done 
and helping to share that with others. We can talk about that all day long, but it would be really helpful if you can share examples. Um, so not just um, bringing your formal thesis or your formal kind of papers that you've written, but also thinking about your process that you've got, that you like all the different pieces of writing, all the different ways that you've managed your work and thought through your work. So building up that portfolio and sharing that with others um, and being able to speak to that in a really detailed, intentional manner. Yeah. Like, for instance, I think mm -hmm. a really actionable takeaway that Catherine and I were brainstorming before we sat down to record yeah. this was instead of submitting a writing sample of an academic paper that you wrote in grad school, don't do that. Don't do that for <laughs> a corporate job. Oh, my God. Yeah. Don't submit a literary essay for a corporate job. Um, they won't know what to do with it. <laughs> they won't know what to do with it. I don't even know what to do with yeah. it. I have incredibly talented PhD level writers interested in consulting as part of Untold. And I know the value of a literary essay and I believe in it. Mm -hmm. But if somebody brings that even to me at Untold and says, here's my writing sample, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Instead of doing that, it would be more effective most likely in most cases mm -hmm. that I would that I can see to write a case study instead of like submitting this full draft that nobody's going to read or have right. time to read or navigate right. write a one page case study where you say here was the problem here was the research question here's how I approached it here was the solution right bring us along in your way of thinking about how to conduct that kind of research and that kind of writing assignment right and how, just how you think, you know, yep. what research question led you to another research question and another one and how did you right. answer them along the way? Right. And who did you consult and how did you pull in resources? So that is that like meta commentary, that like zoomed out view right. of how you think and write that people want to see. And once they see yeah. it, they'll know, oh, I can translate that into this particular need that I have in my right. business unit or in my nonprofit. Right. Yeah, and at, in doing that, hopefully it will help you think through where are your strengths in that process, where are areas that you could yeah. really build up um, and pay attention to, because that's something that, again, going back to the question of what I wish I had learned, I wish I had paid attention to a little bit more of that, so I could have spoken to that earlier on that in my career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another practical tip was universities don't own your content. You own your content, and not to be too, like, brutal and marketing <laughs> marketing -y <laughs> in this video. But if you are creating videos for your students, if you are writing really interesting articles about a theory that you have just uncovered mm -hmm. in a graduate course, if if you are doing if you are writing LinkedIn articles or you know just designing course experiences for people, that yeah. is all highly valued. It is your property. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm like going to step on some toes by saying this, but that's yours and you should be doing that work in graduate school. And I wish more than anything that mm -hmm. in grad school I had created that content, especially my teaching content, in a way that I could have then taken it to a company and said, here's a training that I have on business writing. Um, I want you to pay me for doing it and yeah. for providing it to your employees. Because yeah. I am, we're recreating all that stuff now at Untold, yeah. and if I had committed to viewing the content that I was designing as my own, and yeah. organizing it and keeping it really like pack it, like thinking about how to package it for an audience outside of the classroom at right. the university that was paying us, you know, peanuts to do it as grad students. I could have made a good living <laughs> on that alone. Yeah. So it'd be a great thing to start with too. Yeah. yeah. Corporate training. That's mm -hmm. a great place to start. It's very yeah. similar to what you're doing in academia too. Yeah. What else? I mean, yeah. I think in that way too, like yeah. committing to your own thought leadership, whatever yeah. that looks like. Um, or if you, you know, whether it's thought leadership or you want to call it public intellectualism, if yeah. you have insights to share, share them regularly and consistently yeah. on a platform that you feel like you could grow an audience and that will help create opportunities for you, whether that means employment opportunities or client opportunities or speaking engagements. So um, I would right. continue to put your thoughts and your insights out there and continue to represent our field well in that way so that more people understand the value that we hold as English majors. Right. Thanks for listening to us. 
And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. <laughs> we have the, the new UTC. We, no, seriously though, I would like to know if graduate students, if you found this useful, you could send us an email or comment on the video mm -hmm. because if this is something that's useful to people, we would like to continue making, yeah. you know, more videos that dive into these topics in a little more detail or right. more actionably yeah. too. And that's a tip too. Keep in connection with those that you know that have been in the field and have tried different things yes. because that's a way to really build on your network and then see what other people are doing, the challenges they've run into and... Um, you can learn from them. So make sure you're keeping those connections. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.